Hello, welcome to another video with uh, Ray and Jenny. And we finished our games to start the hobby with video. We both talked about it, you know, I said, why not do a video of where they should go after they've gotten used to those style of games. And she relented and said, we can talk about it. So we got six games each that we think are the next step beyond those beginner uh, games. And I keep calling them beginner games. That's not entirely true because I still love all those games we talked about. 1901, uh, Harry Potter deck builder. They're great and they're still in our collection because we play them. But when you're ready and you want to try something new or different, these are where you want to go. So should I start? Sure. Uh, we talked about King of Tokyo, which is a great game. We've got a lot of play out of what's called Roll Through the Ages. This happens to be the Bronze Age. I recommend the Bronze Age. You like the Iron Age better because it adds a little bit more. But Roll Through the Ages is the next style of Yahtzee mechanic game where basically it's a roll and write. You're gonna roll and try and fill in different things. You're trying to fill in monuments or get technology. And occasionally you will have some form of play come through. So I think this is a great game. I love this one. And we keep it in our, our collection and we've played it quite a bit. It's, it's a lot of fun and I like the, the sim building nature of it, but it works really quick and easy. Mm -hmm. um, a nice chunky wooden dice, pretty cool. Punk. Yeah. Um, this is Baron Park. This is you get to build your own zoo. Um, it's all bears, Baron Park. Um, and uh, it's a good one if you played some something like you know even Carcassonne where you're like okay I've been building my little cities. Um, this one you're each individual. You each have your own zoo, and you are slowly you know kind of making yours. And the first person to finish their zoo fill in all their their, their slots is going to end the game and then everyone gets so much time to finish. Um, there's a lot of really uh, neat pieces to this. Um, I love how that as you cover it, it's what you cover up gets what are your actions. So you really have to strategically play, but you've also got to fill up your entire grid. You end up with four parts. You start with one, you end up with four parts. Um, and everyone's zoo looks different. Um, and there's some really interesting, fun-looking pieces in them as you're trying to Tetris them together. And if you've ever played Tetris, you'll enjoy this as well. That's a fun one. I've pulled that out quite a bit lately. Is it is it the next step? Some people would argue that it's it's a, a, a foundational game, but I think think you need to have played a tile playing one. But it works really well. The big thing is is if you haven't played in a, a very many modern board games, a lot of times you don't have. The basic rule sets down and so something like that can be a little daunting if you haven't played anything. Yeah. Snow Tales. I like racing games. We've talked about that in a bunch of different games uh, videos and some people even said have you played Formula Day, Formula D? Yes I have. It's a great game but we don't own it. We do own Snow Tales. So you do down for us. You play it. Works really good. All levels. All player counts. But you want some more strategic choices? Snowtails is it. Now, being in Alaska, there's a certain amount of you know dog sled theme draws you to it. But what you have is three cards on your sled. Those three cards decide how far how fast you go. So you add the two front cards, your two sled dogs, you add them together, and minus what your brake card is. That's how many spaces you're gonna go. But you also have to have turns and move around. So the difference between the cards, if you've got a slower dog on one side, you're going to drift. So you've got to think that through and set up your play uh, in your hand. Sorry, my son just ran by. Set up your games and uh, your games. All right, set up your cards. I'm not going to edit this out. It's a family channel. Families stuff goes on. You gotta set up and pick your cards and when to play them at the right time. It's great. It, it's a lot of fun. We played every year as Iditarod's running because you know, gotta play I the did theme. Run, yeah. uh, but uh, and he doesn't like my mushly Iditarod's game from the nineteen seventies that mm -hmm. he detests. So you know, this is the compromise. You've game. never actually found the rules. Yes, we did. Kara sent them to me. They were bad rules. Yes, but I do have the rules now. Fair enough. That. 
Play snow tails. Don't play mushing. Well, and you probably can't find it unless you know you were a child in the eighties in Alaska. So, anyways, um, this is evolution, and we actually have evolution beginning too. That wasn't in um, our beginner list, but it could have very well yeah. been. It's a game that we started our ten-year-old who loves dinosaurs out on. Um, and then this is the next step. It's a tableau builder. You are pretty much you've got a couple of dinosaurs in front of you, and they're making babies. And you're trying to, and then you could be eating other ones, and you could be attacking them. Um, so it's really neat. There's a lot of pieces to it. There's a lot of expansions to this game as well. So if yeah. you do end up liking it, you can really take it farther. Um, but if, like, this game seems like a little too much as you look at it, the beginning is another great one. But it introduces you to the idea of that I'm working on, you know, what I've got in front of me, and I'm adding to them. But you're also then, you can attack other players. And so there's a lot of pieces to that, and it's a lot of fun, and uh, we really like the theme for our kids particularly. Yep. That one's fun. Okay, all of our games are fun, at least to us, so. Otherwise it wouldn't happen. That's correct. This is The City. Now, it's been reprinted a number of times. There's a game out there called Race for the Galaxy. I love Race for the Galaxy. I hate teaching Race for the Galaxy. There's icons for everything, and it drives me nuts. And what it is, is a tableau, so putting cards in front of you, engine building game. This does it without all of the bad icons. I can teach this. What's really cool about this one is it starts out, and your first person to 50 ends the game. You finish the round, whoever has the most points. In your first turn, you get like one. This is going to be forever. The game will not last longer than eight turns. Second turn, you're like, oh, I got three. And now I get a bunch of cards, because cards are what you play to build, to put other cards down. So it's, a, it's another game where cards count as both currency and what you want to play. I love that mechanic also. That's kind of, this looks great. It's fun. It's quick. And it does take some thought, because what cards do you discard and what card do you play really does matter. This is where my brain breaks. I want to play everything. Um, San Juan is a very yeah. similar version of that one that I enjoyed the theme of, of San Juan, but this one's a nice, really good one, too, um, and they both work really well. This is Sagrada, and this is if, you know, you've kind of done some of the abstracts and you want to move up, this is one where you're, you know, making a stained glass window. Yeah, it looks pretty and in it, the end. It does look like one. It, it, it does, and it looks very pretty when you're done. And you've got a pattern, you've got to follow. Um, and so as you're rolling dice, and the cool thing is, is at the beginning of the turn, one person rolls all the dice, and then they pick one, then it goes all the way around to the end person, and the end person gets to pick two, and then it goes back. So you get to, if you pick first, you also get whatever's left, and you've got to put them in. Um, and it's one of those games that you can kind of have a conversation as you're waiting for the dice to come back to you. Um, not highly stressful. There's uh, a nice five to six player expansion. There's really, I haven't had problems playing it at six players. Yeah. Um, and it's really pretty, it's relaxing, but there is a lot of strategy into how you put your dice into it. And again, if you haven't played a lot of games, it can feel like, what's going on, but once you've played a couple games, it's a really easy game to pick up in just a few minutes. The rules are really easy mm -hmm. to teach, so it's a great next step that ends up, you, you get a very pretty finished product, and you get, oh, look what I made, and you feel really good mm -hmm. about it. I agree. That one's kind of dice drafting is great. This will, I'll hold this up. Mm -hmm. This is an excellent game. The insert is amazing. And it looks boring as all get out on the cover. Unless you're a Russian story, and then it looked cool just because. This, this, this game looks incredibly boring. And if you like Risk, this takes it to another level. But this is definitely a next level game. You gotta think a little bit out, uh, out of the box. The actions, you bid on and how you bid on them is not really bidding you've got a bunch of meeples that have numbers on it you put them down but 
you're going to end up moving your meeples around on the action you pick because someone places a higher value on it, you will be moved down to a lesser ability on that one. You can use gold to make your guy cooler and go above everybody else. But you also have to think where you want things to go first and the timing's different. I actually really think this one works well two player. And any bidding game that works well two player and higher that has an insert and an organization that makes it so you can set it up in what, four minutes, five minutes, and get a huge thematic gameplay out of it, this is great. Ruik, Don of Kiev, I should probably say the name. Yeah. I, I know when we first opened it, we looked and we're like, oh shoot, it's it's got this bidding mechanic and we're like, oh, it's going to play horrible two-player. And it didn't. We were so shocked, which was cool because I was so excited about the theme. And usually I'm not the the area control person, like, oh, yeah. you know, that's not my type of game. And it's a game I enjoy because I enjoy the theme, but works mm. really well. We just, I think, kickstarted the expansion. Yes. <laughs> okay. So now I like worker placement a lot. You watch my top 10, I like them a lot. This is a great starter worker placement game. This is Lords of Waterdeep. And it can look kind of scary to people because they think, oh, it's, you know, it's Dungeons and it's Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons theme. And you know, that kind of a lot of people just screams geek. I don't like Dungeons and Dragons. Never played it. I, I have no interest in playing it. You sure? Yeah, pretty okay. much. He can like it, but um, not my type of theme at all. And I really enjoy this game. Um, and so, yep. you know, it's definitely fancy. They're, they're little cubes. They could be anything. The, it, it's themeless, but it's a great introduction to that worker placement mechanic. Really pretty straightforward to teach and to play. And so if you want to start getting into a little bit heavier games and you want to start getting into that worker placement, because worker placement games, because you have to know what each of the yeah. each of the you know the stations do, can feel very overwhelming to someone who's very new to the hobby. So if you've played a few games and you're ready to take on something a little bit meatier, this is a great way to start into the awesome world that is uh, worker placement games. And this one, even, you know, the theme, as I said, can be a little off-putting to some people, but Totally, it's seamless, and you know, you, it could be anything. But if you like Dungeons and Dragons, it's just an additional plus to you. I like it a lot. Um, what was funny is that's one of the first games we bought. It's pretty old, um, and I can, looked at her and said, "We should get this." They they say it's not very Dungeons and Dragony, and she went, "It's got Dungeons and Dragons written on it." I was like, "Let's try it." That's it's a game that's shown a lot of wear because we've played it a lot. Yep. Ooh, this is one of my Drafted. I like it a lot too. We play a lot more Seven Wonders Duel instead of Seven Wonders because we get the two player to the table more often. Uh, you may be hearing some shaking in the background because my son is getting antsy, but I'm, I'm only doing one take. So, uh, Seven Wonders, it's drafting. So this particular case, drafting, you're gonna have seven to, I think it's eight cards, because you're gonna get rid of one, and you're just gonna hand them around to each other. You pick one, play it, hand it around. And the reason this is a next step though, instead of Sushi, unlike Sushi Go, there's a lot of things that deal with scoring, especially when you talk about the sciences, where you, can get an exponential increase. So if you've got three stone tablets, that's worth nine points. But if you have three stone tablets, two, I, I can't remember, uh, the mason, so two science, and, and our, um, they, they've got several symbols. I'm drawing a blank on them. And one of the other ones, you're gonna end up getting seven for the set of three, and, and it can the scoring can get way, way complicated at the end. So this is definitely a next step, but I will tell you, you've got seven people that are, that have at least familiarity with drafting. This will last 35 minutes with all seven players. Um, and there's a lot of really cool expansions. The, the thing though is you have to be willing to go into your first game going, I am not going to know how I'm going to score the end game. And I'm just going to play through it once. And then when I play through it again, and because it's only 35 minutes, you can easily play two games back to back. You have to just be willing to almost 
not care how you turn out the first round because you have to see how all three ages work. Because mm -hmm. I can give you hints as someone who's played it, like, oh, make sure you get resources in age one and age two because there is going to be none in age three and you're going to need them. And explain how the things connect. But until you've actually played through it, it's really hard to get that connection. So it's one of those games that you need to be willing to go, okay, I'm not going to quite get this until I finish the game, but then I'm going to be able to go back and I'm going to really get it as I play the second mm -hmm. round of it. Now, once you've done some deck buildings, this is Dominion. Dominion gets touted as a classic, but it's not really a beginner game because Dominion, you have to keep track of your actions and your buys. There's several pieces to it. So something like Harry Potter Deck Builder, which I talked about in the other video, is a much better starter game. But now you've done some deck building and you want to move up. This is a really great game because there's so much here. So you can easily then start exploring and doing much more with it. Um, there's, you know, 11, 12 expansions at this point. Um, but even just the base box has so many replayability because you ever only play with 10 cards and you can change them each time. We have a randomizer on our Kindle and we just hit randomize on whichever one yep. we're playing with and it gives us 10 cards and we pull them out and throw them down. We never play the same game twice. Um, but it's definitely not, if you've never deck builded, you probably don't want to start with this game. Again, that doesn't sound right. That nope. English sounded De awful. Deck builded? Yeah. Um, build. Yes, deck built. Build. Ah. So um, this definitely, you know, you've done some deck building and you want to take it to the next level. This is the game to pull out and try. Yep. Um, Co-op. We talked about Forbidden Island as the gateway game. And some people will go, well, you could then go to Pandemic. You can, but everybody talks about Pandemic. And not enough people talk about Horrified. Considering it's October, we're going to talk about Horrified. Horrified is you're dealing with the classic Universal Monster Studio monsters. you got the Wolfman. You've got the um, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Dracula, Frankenstein, the Mummy. But these aren't the new ones. These are the old classic monsters, and you're working together to defeat three of them. Each one needs to be dealt with differently, and it's really cool. I like this one a lot. You move around, you work, to, you actually do work together, you're trading stuff. It's great, and it's fun, and it's available at Target. Um, it's not that expensive. I think it's good, but it can be overwhelming rules-wise because every Monster is different. Every monster needs to be beat differently, and that means there's a lot of additional complication at trying to figure out what you should be doing. So don't get frustrated if you're trying it. Just keep giving it a shot. I think it's great. It's a lot of fun. Obviously, it's a good one for you know to play in October. This is Kingsburg. And this is a uh, dice game. You're gonna roll dice and you get to do cool stuff with them. Um, and you're putting them out on a big, you've got a big board in the middle and you get to go to different places and do different actions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're using the dice as your action thing. And uh, it's really, at its heart, a very simple game. Once you've played it a couple times, really easy to get. But definitely there's a lot of pieces to it and with the dice and the board. It can seem overwhelming to someone who hasn't played a lot of games, mm -hmm. but you've played some games and you're wanting to try something a little bit different. This is a really fun way to do that. I love all the different action choices you have. It seems like no matter what happens, what you roll, there's something cool you can do. And that's really neat because sometimes you feel like, I rolled badly, I can't do anything this turn. This is, you can always do something with your roll mm -hmm. because you can add your dice in different ways and you can break them up. And so you can put all your dice in one for a really big, one big action, or you can do a couple little actions. And so I really enjoy that aspect of it that you've got, you know, so many different choices. But again, all those choices can be overwhelming to someone brand new, but once you've been in it for a while, all those choices are just so enjoyable. Yeah. And they have a second edition out that includes a lot of the stuff that the expansion had in it. It's really good. So those are our next step games. Uh, a lot of times beginner games or gateway games, people also give them, uh, I think they're great. I still play Ticket to Ride all the time. I still play 1901. I still play Harry Potter Deck Builder. But sometimes you want a little bit more or you want to see what else is out there. This is where you go with it. So. And these are also a lot of different uh, 
types of games. And a lot of times when you start with the beginner, when you're starting out with the new stuff, you want to start out with, with mechanics you already understand. Um, and these are a lot of times are going to add in really cool new mechanics that then as you want to go even farther, you're going to already know those mechanics. And then it's easier to understand the next rule book because rule books are scary. Um, and I think all these have pretty decent rules with them. And that's also an important factor. Yep. All right. Thank you. Goodbye.